This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 14th of July, 2022. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space management and acquisition. We uh, operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements, all meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes a notice of intent for work by the Department of Public Works on Winter Street, a request for an amendment of an existing order on Coles Meadow Road, and a notice of intent for construction of an accessory residential building on North Farms Road. Uh, we also have a discussion about uh, dogs in conservation areas and uh, a consideration of a certificate of compliance on Ridgeview Road. Uh, first item is, uh, well, let me have first ask if we have any public comment that is general and not having to do with a specific case. If not, we'll move to approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes, one for both on March 24th, once for the regular session and one for the executive session. Can someone uh, give a motion to approve the minutes of March 24th? I'll move. Mason moved, and we have a second? Second. Second by Jen. Um, any modifications, amendments to those minutes? If not, all in favor? Uh, Siri, need a roll call? Yes, please. Jen? Yes. Jason? Yes. Mason? Yes. Paul? Muted, Paul. I oh, you were upstate, okay. All right, and Kevin? Yes. All right, thank you. And same, uh, we need the same date, but we need a motion for the executive session minutes. Come on, someone. I so move. Jen moved. Is there a second? Second. Jason, any amendments? amendments? Modifications? Discussion? Echoes. Echoes? Echoes, right, there are echoes. If not, all the All right, Jen? Yes. yes. Jason? Yes. Mason? Yes. Paul? Abstain. And Kevin? Yes. yes. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll move to the first case, uh, which is a continuation and notice is intent for DPW work on Winter Street. Uh, let's see, I assume maybe Joanna's here to talk about that. Yes, she, I'll, be, I'll be presenting. Good, please proceed. Sarah, I have a presentation. Is it possible to share my screen? Yep, you should be able to now. Okay. Can everybody see? Everybody see that slide? Not yet. Okay. No. Okay. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Okay, evening, everyone. So let me start by saying uh, Winter Street is a dead end road that begins on the east side of Prospect Street and slopes down toward a forested wetland associated with Barrett Brook. 
the road was accepted and paved to a length of 475 feet. An open unpaved area, approximately 70 feet long and 33 feet wide is located beyond the end of the pavement and was never accepted. The DPW recently took an easement over this area. The boundary of a bordering vegetated wetland is located approximately 20 feet from the northeast corner of this easement and a portion of the proposed work falls within the 100 foot wetland buffer. Winter Street is in need of water and sewer line replacements and repaving. In addition, catch basins along the street are connected to the sewer system and must be disconnected to comply with Massachusetts Water Pollution Control Regulations 314 CMR. This project proposes to replace the utility lines within the street right of way and repave the roadway within the existing footprint. The project also proposes to disconnect the existing catch basins from the sewer line and allow surface flow to travel overland towards the end of the roadway. The elevation of the existing roadway will be lowered to reduce the slope and slow the velocity of flow. In addition, DPW proposes to construct a packed gravel area adjacent to the end of the pavement to disperse and slow further slow runoff to less than two feet per second as it leaves the project area and before it reaches the wetland area. This packed gravel area at the end of the roadway will have a three foot border of small riprap, which is designed to help stabilize the gravel. Work for the utility line replacement and repaving is covered under the DPW's general order of conditions. The proposed drainage work and the packed gravel spreader require notice of intent application. This project meets the criteria for a redevelopment project. Resource area falls within the 100 foot buffer of a bordering vegetated wetland associated with Barrett Brook and proposes to alter approximately 650 square feet of this area for construction of the gravel spreader. Some additional surface flow to this area is also proposed as a result of disconnecting the catch basins from the sewer system. To better understand the drainage impacts from disconnecting the catch basins, DPW conducted a hydrocat analysis for the entire project area. Two catchment areas were delineated. Uh, first catchment area is the area that drains to the two catch basins in the lower part of Winter Street. And the second catchment area is the area below that, which drains directly towards the wetland. The upper catchment area is about 67,300 square feet, which includes roadway sidewalks and residential development. The lower catchment area totals 13,500 square feet and also includes roadway sidewalk and residential area. For the purpose of the hydrocat analysis, it was assumed that the upper two catch basins were functioning as designed but the lower catch basin um, is not functioning well and flow bypasses this catch basin altogether and just drains directly to the wetland. The hydrocat analysis looked at a two-year storm event of 3.09 inches and a 10-year storm event of 4.93 inches. Analysis of pre-construction conditions indicate that about 2.77 cubic feet per second are captured in the basins during a two-year event and 0.6 cubic feet per second flows off site. During a 10 year storm, three cubic feet are captured and about 3.5 cubic feet per second flow off site. Post construction, about 3.1 cubic feet per second would flow off site in a two year storm and 6.3 cubic feet per second would flow off site in a 10 year storm. This translates to an increase of about 2.5 cubic feet per second for a two year storm and 2.8 cubic feet per second in a 10 year storm. This flow is expected to disperse within the wetland and eventually reach um, Barrett Brook. Um, and so just for some context on these numbers, um, CDM Smith conducted analysis of flow through the culvert that passes under the bike path in 2014. Um, and their analysis indicated that about the total flow through that culvert during a two-year storm was about 47 cubic feet per second. Um, and the flow from a 10 year storm, which was a little bit less than a 10 year storm is now, was about 114 cubic feet per second. So the additional flow that's being proposed to this area is, is pretty minimal. DPW did consider three different alternatives for this project. Alternative one was to repave the road, replace the utilities and keep the drainage as it is. This is not really a viable alternative to the requirement to remove the stormwater flow from the sewer. 
Alternative two involves repaving the road, replacing the utilities and installing new catch basins that would outlet to a new drain line that outfalls to a riprap basin within the wetland buffer at the end of the roadway. This design would involve removing five trees that are located beyond the edge of the pavement. Um, so there's a, there's a wetland impact, wetland buffer impact there. Um, and it's also more challenging to engineer an outfall at that location that would reduce the flow enough so that it doesn't cause erosion into the wetland or near the wetland. Um, for that reason, the not, that option wasn't really pursued. Alternative three is the option that was chosen, um, replacing the utilities, repaving the road, disconnecting the catch basins from the sewer and adding an area of dense grade crushed stone and riprap adjacent to the end of the pavement in order to slow the flow leaving the roadway so that by the time it reaches that, leaves that area, it's about, it's less than two feet per second. Um, this design better disperses runoff to prevent erosion within the wetland buffer area. It allows the flow to travel overland through a vegetated grassy area before reaching the wetland. Um, for th this option has the least impact to the resource area we felt and most closely meets the stormwater standards. Um, so in terms of the stormwater standards, um, this project qualifies as a redevelopment project as it involves maintenance and improvement of an existing roadway, does not propose a net increase in a pervious area, and involves work to separate storm drains from sanitary sewer. As a redevelopment project, it's only required to meet standards two, three, and the pretreatment and structural BMP portions of standards four, five, and six to the maximum extent practical and to improve existing conditions. For standard one, the project doesn't propose any new conveyances um, and has been designed to slow runoff to prevent erosion near and within the wetland area. For standard two, the post-development peak discharge rates are expected to exceed pre-development peak discharge rates due to the requirement to um, disconnect the catch basins from the sewer system. Um, the soils in the area are hydrologic soil group C, so they have pretty limited infiltration capacity. Um, and it, in addition, the right of way is only 33 feet, so there's really limited area um, to try to design a system to slow, <clears throat> to slow or retain the water. Uh, for standard three, uh, loss of ground, recharge to groundwater has been minimized through the removal of about 860 square feet of paved sidewalk on the south side of the road, which will be converted to lawn area. Um, the sidewalk on the north side of the road remains. Um, in addition, stormwater that was previously piped to the sewer system will instead flow over land, um, increasing the potential for infiltration. Um, for standard four, Opportunities for TSS removal within the project limits and within the existing right of way are limited, as I mentioned. Uh, DPW conducts regular street sweeping and runoff from the roadway is expected to, and runoff from the roadway is expected to pass over vegetation, vegetated area before reaching the wetland, which hopefully will um, provide some TSS removal. Uh, standard five, there are no uh, levels that are proposed in this project. Standard six, there's no critical areas near the project area. Um, for standard seven, the project is expected to improve existing conditions in three ways. One, the stormwater flow to the sewer system will be removed. For two, a small net decrease in impervious area will result in removing, um, takes place when the sidewalk, part of the sidewalk is removed. And third, the we're reducing the slope of the roadway. Um, with the goal of reducing the runoff from the roadway and towards the wetland area. Um, in terms of erosion and sedimentation, um, plan straw bottles will be used during construction between the project area and the adjacent uh, wetland area. Um, for standard nine, an operation and maintenance plan for the gravel spreader, including periodic inspections for erosion will take place 
um, any damage or erosion that's identified within the footprint of the easement area will be repaired. Uh, lastly, no illicit discharges to the stormwater management system are expected to occur. So with that, um, are there any questions? I have a few. Um, the spreader disturbs me a little bit, I guess. Um, if it's not perfectly level side to side, you're going to end up with erosion pretty quickly. And um, once it gets clogged up with fines coming off the street after sanding and stuff, it's going to be like a concrete walk. Water's really going to rip down there. I'm wondering if any of that was considered um, or some type of level lip spreader at the base of it. Maybe, I, I, I don't know, but it, it seems like it will get clogged up fast after, especially after the winter season. Yeah, um, I don't know if David wants to chime in here, but the, the modeling that we did between the, the slope of the road being reduced um, is really should slow down the water. Um, you know, and by the time it reaches that, that sort of gravel area and has a chance to spread across the gravel area and sort of off towards, towards the Northeast corner there, um, we expect that it will be moving pretty slowly um, and won't, won't be a cause for gener uh, erosion. But David, if you I would you just add a, a couple of things to that, uh, Johanna. One is that uh, we are um, putting a, a, a slight raise in the, uh, in the bituminous at the curb line up at where Winter Street intersects with uh, Prospect Street so that we're making sure that we're maintaining the gutter line on Prospect Street and not uh, getting uh, flows from Prospect Street uh, coming down Winter Street. So that should reduce the, the amount of flows coming down Winter Street. There's also a natural uh, grade at the end of the street that um, is uh, to, um, from the uh, south to the south to the north, there's a natural grade that's directed sort of towards the wetland. And we intend to sort of maintain that grade there so that there'll be uh, some cross slope uh, flow from, from the uh, right hand side of the roadway uh, off across the spreader. We don't particularly want to put in a level lip spreader for maintenance purposes. Um, the, at, the easement includes uh, snow storage, which has traditionally been uh, placed at the end of the street on this uh, private uh, set private way section of the street. Uh, the city is not actually allowed to plow private ways, uh, but the easement has allowed us to uh, maintain snow storage here so that the, the neighbor's uh, property can still be cleared of, of snow. Um, if we try to put in a uh, uh, a significant piece of, of, of stone <clears throat> uh, vertically, we're afraid that there's going to be uh, the likelihood that it's going to wash out behind that um, and uh, require uh, additional maintenance above and beyond what would be needed on, on an annual basis after snow season. Uh, so uh, we feel like uh, what we need to do is have an operations and maintenance plan that uh, inspects uh, the condition of this after heavy rain events and uh, certainly in the at the end of the snow season and uh, basically repair as necessary uh, to maintain that that uh, the slopes there for drainage off to the north and to uh, make sure that there's not any erosion occurring and that there's still uh, some uh, enough uh, that uh, the fines haven't created a, a, a compacted surface where you're losing that energy dissipating uh, ability of the spreader that's installed. Is this something new or has this been tried on some other streets in Northampton? 
Uh, we have done something similar up on uh, North Farms Road with a recent roadway reconstruction up there, and it seems to be holding up well. That's all I got. You have more questions, Mason? No, that, that was it. What kind of uh, maintenance, uh, operation and maintenance plan might uh, prevent the accumulation of the fine particulates from sanding and so forth, so that as Mason describes, you, you, you fill in all those gaps and you don't get a lot of infiltration? Well, it may mean uh, taking a section of it out, you might need to take uh, six or eight inches of material it out and replace it with new if, uh, if it becomes, uh, becomes clogged with sand. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? I just um, have one quick oh. question. Um, just, I may have go ahead, Jason. Joanna's presentation, but are, are the soil conditions in the area, would they exclude like a leaching basin being a viable option? The basins? I, yeah, they're um, hydrologic soil group C, they're Belgrade silt loams. Um, so they don't really have much infiltration capacity. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Jen, you had a question? Just a question about, I, I can't remember if you said this, but what grade of gravel would you be using? Like what size gravel? So the, um, the gravel spreader area is a four inch minus. Mm -hmm. And then there's a three foot wide sort of border of small riprap. Um, around that on three sides. And those three sides are sort of the, in the direction of where the water would shed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Oh. How often will uh, DPW normally monitor the area? I, uh, I would imagine David, do you want to? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, after significant storm events, if we have a significant downpour, I mean, we can certainly go and take a look just to make sure that there hasn't uh, been any erosion uh, as a result of the storm. And obviously, if there has, then we need to address that. Um, and as I said, also, uh, you know, if uh, uh, certainly in the spring after the winter season, winter plowing season, that would be uh, a time we would review that as well. Do you rely on the street sweeper to give reliable reports to DPW? Uh, we rely on the uh, sewer and drain division. We have, you know, certain trouble areas that we ask them to monitor on an ongoing basis. And uh, we, we try to reduce the number of those by creating fixes uh, so that we don't uh, just keep adding to the list. But uh, we would certainly add this location to the list as one to be monitored. Okay, that's all I have. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, there was uh, a, a supplemental uh, opinion uh, rendered by Berkshire Design. I assume you've seen that letter. Do you have any comments on the option that they were floating that might be considered as an alternative that they thought uh, had not been properly considered? I think the main thing that, that Berkshire was requesting that we look at was the level lip spreader. And it was the same uh, thing that, that Mason had mentioned as well, which is uh, a traditional uh, way of dissipating uh, flows. Uh, typically, you don't see something like that installed uh, in a roadway in an area that would be plowed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our main concern uh, as far as that being a potential solution is just the, the disparate materials and the likelihood of, um, of, of uh, differential settlement between the two. And then the repair work on something like that becomes much more labor intensive because you now have you know, an 18 inch deep by however, uh, you know, eight or 10 foot long uh, stone that you need to excavate out again and then reestablish at a level uh, condition and then reestablish the uh, the stone around that. So we feel like from a maintenance point of view, it's actually going to be more expeditious and and uh, make more sense to actually 
monitor what we're calling just a gravel spreader that is actually not fully level. It already, as I say, wants to match the existing grades that, that flow away from the existing residence to the right so that we're not creating any impacts uh, inadvertently over to that residence as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the public? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? Moved. Oh, and wait, wait. someone has their hand up. And oh, I didn't see. Yeah, I just put it up. Uh, okay, sir. How you doing? I'm Christopher Niebuhr. Um, my parents uh, live at the end of Winter Street. Um, the um, the car that you see in one of the uh, pictures that uh, Joanna had in uh, her presentation is uh, my parents' car and what they use <clears throat> currently as their as their driveway. Um, I I commissioned Berkshire Design Group to do a review of the Department of Public Works um, design proposal. Um, I'm, I'm assuming everybody in the, the commission read it or saw it. Um, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the um, one of the statements um, that the engineer Berkshire Design Group made to me um, was that if uh, myself as an engineer, if I was to submit this proposal um, as an individual, it wouldn't get approved in the state that it's at right now. And um, as my parents being, um, you know, utilizing that, that strip, um, there's, you know, several deficiencies that were pointed out in the review. And I don't think any of them were, were really addressed by either of the members of the, the, the DPW. Um, I've been talking with Greg uh, Newman. He's the engineer who I believe reports to um, the other um, DPW engineer who's on the, the call tonight. Um, and, you know, the, um, one of the things that he was very explicit about with me um, up until last week is that there was, there was no maintenance schedule and there is not a maintenance schedule intended for this area. Mm -hmm. I, specific, I specifically asked for that as, you know, fellow engineer houses, you know, the, the obvious problem, which Mason pointed out um, was what happens with any debris that comes down the street. It, you know, the reduced velocity you know, um, you know, I, under, I understand models and I make models for a living, um, but I also live in the real world. Um, and the most obvious problem is that thing is not gonna become functional after a very short period of time, nor is it um, uh, designed such that, um, you know, two octogenarians, one to be 90 the following year are gonna be able to walk on. Um, that last is beyond our purview. I understand. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Term, I'm but... just, you're, yeah, and I apologize. I'm just point, you know, point something out is because one of the other members said, well, is there, you know, the alternative, the alternative is to go with the, 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 the drain pipe and have it go back there with, you know, you know, a traditional looking field and, 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 and slowing it down and less impact to, you know, or almost, you know, no impact to the, to the area which my parents utilize um, for uh, for parking. Um, and I'm and, and I'm relatively certain based on Johanna's comments that you know the reason that they're that they're going um, with the the third option in the design is that it's the cheapest doesn't mean that design two can't work. They just start choosing not to do it. And having, having all that water and all that debris dumped at the end of Winter Street, um, it is, uh, it, you know, it's gonna be an issue. Do uh, either of the presenters want to address that before we move on?
I think that. Oh. Go ahead, Dave. As I recall, uh, reading the letter from Berkshire Design, so uh, I don't see anything in the letter um, specifically that expresses what Mr. Niebuhr expressed Berkshire said to them. So I'm taking that uh, on faith, if you will, uh, but it was not addressed to us that it wouldn't be approved uh, if it were submitted by an individual. And uh, number five of Berkshire design is that they would suggest the alternative of putting in a level lip spreader. And I believe we've discussed the challenges of that from a maintenance point of view. And I believe that Johanna has indicated the impacts of actually putting in a drainage system that would have a new outfall, the impacts that that would have to the wetland resource area. Uh, and the possibility that it would actually be more impactful than what it is that the DPW was proposing. And if I might, if I yeah. might add that, um, in in trying to um, address the standards that are expressed in the city's wetland ordinance, <clears throat> you know, part of our goal is to keep the construction activity as far away from the resource area as possible. Um, you know, and particularly where the other alternative involves removing trees, live trees, um, closer to the wetland area. This is something that we're trying to stay away from and we're trying to mitigate those kinds of impacts. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I'm the uh, counselor who represents Winter Street. I've talked with uh, the residents at the uh, at the dead end uh, of Winter Street who are most affected by this. Uh, as as was stated, uh, the council last month approved the uh, the easements, um, and I am speaking uh, to support the project and its expeditious. Uh, approval. Uh, this is something that has been uh, waiting for some time after uh, major damage was caused to homes and uh, other property on, uh, on Winter Street, uh, resulting from water main breaks in 2006 and 2019. Uh, the infrastructure needs to be replaced, and I am uh, confident that the Department of Public Works has chosen the correct solution to this. We've heard uh, that uh, the, uh, there will be no tree removal, which is uh, um, favorable. Uh, the, the water flow will be slowed. And we've heard that there will be um, a regular monitoring after storms to uh, ensure that it's properly maintained. So I, I urge approval of this. Thank you. Thank you. And there was another uh, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to support uh, Stan's position. I'm Catherine Basham. I'm uh, one of the residents at the end of Winter Street. I have but the area that's uh, being considered. And I wanted to just reiterate that um, I have been in contact with a number of the residents and the majority of the residents on the street are fully in support of moving forward with the plan. And there was that unanimous support from the council to move forward. Um, I suffered the most damage on the street, certainly in this last um, uh, flood in 2019, $40,000 worth of damages to my home, my land, only half of it was covered. And in 2006, I had uh, less damage, but also considerable. So we, I and others on the block at this point, the majority of the residents on the block fully support moving forward with the understanding that we're being as cautious as possible with consideration of the issues around conservation. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go Lisa. on and, and make a kind comment to the DPW. I know there's always friction between commissions and the, the DPW, but as far as their um, checking up and monitoring um, areas of concern. I live on a street where almost after every rainstorm, there are 
running up to the end of the street to see if the uh, drain's been clogged. It's up off there. Um, so they're uh, lifted. I, you know, I, they never used to do that. And then just recently, there's been some problems. So they're, uh, they're, they're very uh, fastidious in getting up and checking on troubled areas in the, in the city. And no doubt I'll, that they'll add this to their list and do the same thing. Uh, and I'll just add that Mason says that it's been, I guess, 14 years on Conservation Commission, I've come to rely on Mason as the stormwater expert at, uh, among the commissioners. So he's, he used to do that stuff for a living. And um, I, uh, I tend to, to have a lot of respect for his judgment about these things. Is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And a second. 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 All in favor need a uh, roll, call roll call to go, to go. Uh, in, uh, out of out hearing, hearing and into discussion, discussion Sarah? Sarah? Uh, we do. Jen? Yes. yes. Jason? Yes. yes. Uh, Mason? Yes. yes. Paul? Yes. yes. And Kevin? Yes. yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. All right. Um, so we have a, a question of whether to grant an order of conditions um, for this project as currently defined. Um, my own sense is that I would uh, like to suggest that we approve it um, and that we have a, a condition, an added condition uh, that uh, during the um, first year or first some set of time that the commission be informed about the results uh, photographically or in some other way, the results of DPW monitoring of how it's functioning after it's constructed. Mm. Anybody else have thoughts about uh, uh, the, in general whether to approve and uh, if so, what other conditions might be appropriate? Uh, Kevin, that is the question of how uh, fastidiously it needs to be monitored. And uh, I don't know whether we should say regular um, monitoring or periodic or, or scheduled. Uh, my, my sense is it would be event specific that uh, if there were uh, above a certain amount of rain within a 24 or 72 hour period that uh, would be a cause for monitoring and, and documentation. Um, and if there were uh, a major snowstorm, similarly after clearing, that it would be um, area when it started to melt, that, that would be addressed. Um, so I don't know, Sarah, if you have additional suggestions. Yeah, I, I might suggest at least during the first year after a 10-year storm or greater, and then once at the end of the winter season. How's oh, so that sound for everybody? Kevin, up and up. I guess. Oh, sorry, the echo. My, my thought is that I completely agree with the project as presented. I think upgrading the utilities is critical. And what was only mentioned once was separating the sewer um, in Johanna's presentation. Again, very, very critical. So I have to say, I was surprised that we still have those connections um, anywhere in the city. But yeah. So, so I agree with the project. And I would be a little cautious about putting a, a a maintenance or inspection criteria on this personally, because I, I, I know the city has numerous problem areas that they just have a list of things they address when they feel like they need to be looked at during various weather conditions. So that's my thought, you know, I, I don't want to require them to do it in an order of conditions. Okay. Other thoughts from commissioners? That's fine with me. Um, how about, uh, Jason, if we do something of a compromise that uh, one calendar year after completion, uh, there be uh, 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 an inspection and documentation, photographic and otherwise, uh, sent to the commission so we can say, hey, how to make it through the first year? I, I like that idea. I think that's great. Yeah, thank you. I don't know how everyone else feels, and I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I can do that. I, I like that compromise too. Um, I just wanted to state for the record, I have a lot of empathy for the 
mobility issue with the gravel, um, which as Kevin said is unfortunately, it's out of our purview, but I agree with the need for the um, system updates. And I think this sounds like a reasonable and best plan. <clears throat> Any other discussion among commissioners? If not, uh, so far we have a motion to approve uh, that hasn't been officially made yet, but I'll be asking for a motion to approve with standard conditions, plus uh, a uh, report to the commission uh, a year following the completion of construction about how the system is still functioning. Hmm. Someone wanna make a motion to that effect? Uh, so moved. Jen moves and a second? Second. By Jason. Sarah, um, all in favor? Right, Jen? Yes. Jason? Yes, yes. Mason? Yes. yes. Paul? Yes. yes. And Kevin? Yes. Yes. All right, unanimous. All right, very good. And we are now past this time, so we can move directly to uh, a request for an amendment of an existing order on Coles Meadow Road. I don't know who's here to present about that. Hi, this is Jerome Composio. Good evening. Hopefully you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So again, Jerome Composio. Uh, my wife, Susan, and I are owners of a parcel of land on Coles Mill Road going back almost 25 years now. I was born and raised in Northampton and been a resident most of my life. Our aspiration with this parcel of land on Coles Mellow Road has always been to build a modest single level home for our retirement years, which we are now joyfully entering into. Uh, a few years back, we submitted a notice of intent regarding the driveway for this home. And in August of 20, 2019, we received an approved order condition on this. And then along came the world of COVID and everything, including uh, people and every other thing, was put on hold. So fast forward to just late last year, where we were finally able to get boots on the ground, and it was determined that an earthen fill edge with appropriate stabilization materials would actually be a better design for the driveway plan. And so we submitted an amended notice of intent for your review this evening on the driveway design. It's still proximate along the northern property line as in the prior approved plan, uh, except now it uses earth inside slopes instead of concrete blocks. And just the highlight of that was the earthen design actually disturbs less wetland than if we had used a contract uh, concrete block design. Uh, with me this evening, I believe, is the professionals who assisted in the design of this driveway, Peter LaBarbera, from Environmental Planning Associates and George Costa of Costa Consulting Engineers. So at this time, I, I, I'll turn it over to them to share some further details on this modification to the driveway design. And I, I probably would say, let's, let's start with George Costa, the engineer, if he's available. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon or good evening. I'm, I'm George Costa. And I worked on this project with uh, Peter LaBarbera to uh, evaluate the, uh, potential for erosion. I think that was a concern that the Conservation Commission had. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> erosion occurring along the, uh, the roadbed. We have uh, a gravel proposed gravel road surface, uh, driveway surface, with the side slopes constructed with uh, a crushed stone material. And uh, I looked at the, the uh, proposed driveway, the material that we're proposing to use, and the proposed slopes, side slopes, and the roadbed went through the analysis and and after looking at it a couple of different ways, we were able to conclude that erosion is not will not occur for, for these storm events that we looked at. We modeled the 10-year storms, which is standard for erosion uh, control and um, our velocities that we would generate as a result of sheet runoff are less than uh, the velocity that would be required to cause erosion. The, uh, the roadbed is made out, when I say roadbed, I'm really referring to a driveway surface. The driveway surface consists of a crushed stone material. It's bedrock that's crushed into various sized particles, very angular. That's placed on the road surface. That is the surface which the vehicle will drive on. 
um, that's placed and compacted. Below that is uh, a, a, gravular, a gravel fill, a granular sand and gravel mix that supports the road surface and it's the majority of the material used. And uh, on the side slopes, we're using a two-inch nominal two-inch size crushed stone, again, generated from bed bedrock, very angular, able to support very, uh, remain stable on very steep angles up to well over 45 degrees, almost 50 degrees. And, um, and our side slopes will have an angle of uh, 30 degrees reference to the horizontal. So uh, that's the description of the, of the layout. The, the crushed stone will have a filter fabric underneath the crushed stone on the side slopes of the driveway. That filter fabric bears will rest on the gravel fill that I mentioned earlier, the same gravel fill. And the upper portion of that fabric will be, um, we'll say, uh, placed between the interface of the lower gravel I just mentioned and the superficial dense graded crushed stone that the vehicles will drive on. And inter, uh, we'll say uh, pinching that fabric along the interface will help to hold the fabric in place. So when that's all constructed the way it was as described and compacted to the minimum requirements, uh, which, which is basically uh, at least 95% of its maximum compaction, uh, when all that is accomplished, the the road surface and the side slopes, driveway surface and the side slopes remain stable for the design events that we considered. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Questions from commissioners? I was looking for a sequence of construction. Um, I assume we're going to bring the, the um, replicated wetland area to grade first before you take any of the uh, wetland soils out of the proposed driveway area. So you can transfer them over there. Um, to yeah, um, the the wetland the wetland replicate. Are you saying the wetland area itself or the wetland replication area? No, the replication area has to be brought to grade before you take the oils out of where you're going to put the driveway. Right, except where, where um, to be honest with you, I don't think I've really considered the, the sequence. We know that we're, we're low, we know that we have to lower the grade in the wetland replication area um, to, to accomplish its, the, the desired hydrology. Um, whether it's done before or after, uh, you know, it's, it's, I hadn't really considered it. I don't. I don't know if you know. We can do it either way. I, none of the construction contractors saw that as a as a particular challenge. So, if you'd like to specify that it be done first, we can. Well, yeah, it makes sense. Otherwise, you're stockpiling the muck that you're going to take out of there before you put your. I assume you're going to put a driveway basin. You're not. You're not going to lay it on top of the wetland soils. I assume we're going to take those out of there and use them over in the replication area. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the preparation of the driveway surface, those material, we have a significant upland area to the east um, toward where the house would be constructed that would be a uh, potential stockpile area. I think that if you try to bring material to the west, you're now confronted, the, the wet, wetland replication area is pretty close to the road. Um, I couldn't quote you an exact number without referencing the plan, but um, it would make more sense because there's more area available to, to any soils that are removed to be brought to the east outside of both the, uh, outside of the 100 foot buffer zone and stockpiled there temporarily. Um, and that could include, the, the removal of the soils could include the wetland, you know, preparation of the wetland replication area. Okay. Just, you know, I just, I didn't see a sequence where, you know, I, I know you're going to be removing some soils to put the driveway in. Um, and I, I didn't see whether you were going to stockpile or whether you're going to dig out the replication area first and then place those soils in as they were removed from the driveway area. Logistically, I'm not sure how you were, were going to do this because there wasn't any mention of it. 
Well, the, I mean, the, the, the uh, preparation of the wetland replication area, it has two aspects. One is to lower the grade, but two is to the extent that it's necessary to create an, a moderately impermeable uh, vertical barrier, it might actually have to be supplemented in some places um, because the, the deposition of the silt clay loam that's in that, uh, uh, that area, it varies with depth. There are some places where it's a few inches deep. There are other places, you know, 10 feet away where it's, you know, 12 inches deep or 12 inches thick. So, um, uh, you know, the, the probably if, if thinking about it now that you mention it is I would, I would expect that the contractor would, because the wetland replication is near Coles Meadow Road, I would think that it would be better to surgically dress that or redress that area on the way out. So after any potential damage to the replication area that might be done, that would be when you go back and you fine tune the grading of it. Um, so that would be my personal preference that it actually be done after. Um, but to be honest with you, we had not really consulted the contractors to that level of detail on how they would prefer to do it. We, we do require a sequencing plan prior to construction, um, so that's something that we could look at at that time. But generally, our experience is if the wetland replication does not get done first, it doesn't get done at all. Oh, it, 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 I think Jerome, Jerome can assure you that it, it will get done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's not, that's absolutely will be done. Did, does raise also the, the question of uh, erosion control during construction and what erosion controls might be permanent. I'm sorry, there's an echo. <laughs> yes, indeed. It does raise the question um, that, that you were just addressing with um, Mason about what are going to be the erosion controls both during construction and what erosion controls might be in place permanently. Oh, the 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 construction erosion control will be the installation of the silt fence, which would be tucked under um, to be held to, so it would hold, held stable. It's also gonna be staked to mm -hmm. also help stabilization. And then when, when, the, when the grading of the side slopes is completed, that, those side slopes and the treatment that George just described Will be, that's the permanent erosion control mechanism. And so the silt fence would be manually removed when, when the side slope is compacted and then dressed with the two inch crust, crushed stone. Then the silt, so the silt fence is the last thing to be removed. And, and the, the landscaping material and so forth, that, that whole uh, part of the process will be in your opinion um, a, a permanent form, uh, as permanent as things get, of erosion control for what might otherwise mobilize off the surface of the road. Yes, that's that's George's, in my opinion, that the, the treatment with the filter fabric, the compacted material, the installation of the filter fabric, I'm speaking vertically from bottom to yeah. top, yeah. Uh, followed by the compacted material, the fil followed by the filter fabric, then followed by the two inch crushed stone, um, is then that's your permanent erosion control mechanism. Then when that is down, when that is in place satisfactorily, then the silt fence is taken out. And this is, this is a case where silt fence seems to make more sense than straw wattles. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments from commissioners? And any comments, questions uh, from members of the public? Yeah, I'd like to say something. Um, yes. Can you state your name, please? Yeah, my name is Patricia Mangan. I'm on my husband's uh, account. I'm not Leonard. Um, I have a couple of points. Um, one is, I guess, I think it's hard in contemporary uh conditions with climate to predict erosion over 10 years. Um, 
I don't necessarily think that the last 10 years is a good model to base an understanding of what may erode in the next 10 years in view of changing rainfall and flooding, of which we have a fair amount increasingly. My second point is, um, and I'm a neighbor on Coles Meadow, um, is that the wetland is not just on Coles Meadow Road. It ex extends quite a far, far back, depending seasonally, again, how much rainfall we've had. Um, and that wetlands, as we all know, tend to change. They creep, they grow, they shrink, depending again on weather. So I think a lot of what your main point is based on is a model and a conjecture, which may or may not actually be the case depending on unforeseen weather conditions that are to come in the ensuing years. Also, I guess my last point, now that I'm looking at my notes, is that you initially mentioned that your concern was for erosion, but I'd also like to put, put in a pitch um, for what it's worth for the flora and the fauna that um, will get impacted by this driveway and by whatever wattle and daub or silt or whatever you're using in terms of salamanders, turtles, and other species that some of which are um, very um, endangered. So that's my response to this driveway. And Jerome, while you said you've lived in Northampton most of your life, I don't, you don't live here now. It, uh, but, the purpose of comment period is to speak to the commission, not to welcome Okay, okay, so I made my point. Thank you. Uh, just this is Jerome. Actually, I do live here. So um, I currently live in Westfield while I'm waiting for the home to be built in Northampton. Thank you. Well, the driveway has to be uh, done other, first, and then the house needs to be per given a permit. Uh, I will uh, comment that uh, we understand that the world is changing, and the rules of the Wetlands Act, the Wetlands Ordinance, the guidelines that we have to work within are based on uh, models and uh, uh, that are historically based, and they will be in all likelihood modified over time, but uh, anticipating, as you said, things that are currently unforeseen um, cannot be uh, something that we base our decisions on. So we, we have a set of rules and laws that we have to operate within. Any other comments or questions, uh, Mason? Yeah, I wanna make a comment to that comment. Um, <laughs> uh, all, all culverts, that are put in have to meet the Massachusetts over the uh, criteria that they came up with about 10 years ago. Um, just really to address the wildlife critters back and forth between what um, it, it addresses, you know, the substrate in the pipe itself um, and these are gonna be very low flow pipes anyway. There's at least two that I see on the plan there. Um, they're more like equalizers from one side of the wetlands to the other side of the replicated wetlands are going to be. Um, so I, I, I think that's been addressed. And it's a very, basically a low drive weight, about three feet at the most, at the, uh, most. the height of the driveway. <laughs> Of the, uh, the adjacent wetland, so you're not talking like a you know 20 foot slope that the water is going to be roaring down and causing problems. And when we first uh, uh, considered this uh, before this request for an amendment, uh, we addressed uh, many of those concerns, including how frequently and how large in diameter the culverts under the roadway needed to be and so forth. And those things were all part of our initial um, granting of a permit for the, that order of conditions. Any other comments or questions before we close the hearing? So there is really no um, obstruction to the uh, uh, ability of uh, animals to travel back and forth either over or under the driveway. It remains contiguous. Well, there are pathways 
Um, obviously, yeah. if you, you put a driveway in where there didn't used to be one, that uh, yeah. there is a change. But uh, we've made sure that I think no more than 100 feet apart is my memory, um, that there right. will be these uh, passages under the driveway and with the, uh, the slopes. I mean, in other places in town, we have uh, uh, vertical granite curbs that are really problematic for salamanders and turtles and so forth uh, as they cross rows. This won't have any of those kind of structures. Um, so I want to make a motion to close the hearing. So moved. We have Paul making a motion. Mason, was that a second? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All in favor, Sarah? Jason? Yes. Jen? Yes. Mason? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Um, so uh, someone want to make a, a motion? Uh, what do you think about this, uh, this amendment? Um, I had a question, Sarah, in your staff notes, you had a question about the scope of work and the location of the silt fence. And I maybe I missed an update on that, but did you still have that? Was that answered for us? Yeah, so that was reflected in the revised and updated plan okay. that we provided. Okay. Um, it was just really small details. Like it showed the, the silt fence, but it didn't really connect. So I just wanted to clear that up. So that's okay. Awesome. Okay, so that's resolved for you. I just didn't notice that change. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, a, what do you think? Oh, someone want to make a, a motion to grant the amendment and then we can have further discussion? Well, I just have a question or a, or a thought. You know, I, I, I know we had significant previous discussions on this project and there was an order of conditions implemented that everyone agreed with, mm -hmm. both the project owner and us, and that included the gabions or block walls that supported mm -hmm. the driveway. So now the proposed project introduces a, an earthen slope that has the potential for erosion. And so I guess I don't understand the driver here. You know, there's some language in the application about reduced impacts very minimally, which, which may be true, but I, I'm, I'm uneasy about the long-term erosion issue. And I, I, don't, I don't understand the driver for this change. Um, which I recognize is sort of out of our purview. Well, not really. Um, well, what, if what convinced me, I guess, was what convinced me was that the, uh, the fabric being placed down on the soil, so you're not going to have a lot of soil movement. Then it's held down with a, a two inch layer of, is it a two inch layer, two inch mm -hmm. stone? Um, so I, I, I think that took away my concerns for erosion on a on a you know, on a soil slope. Uh, that that the, the gabion walls were nice, but I, I think it's because the driveway originally was higher than the proposed one now. Um, I think three three feet above the wetlands was probably the, the low point then and it was even higher than that. So I, I, I don't have any problem as far as, as erosion concern. Wouldn't uh, be nice to see plantings along there, but you can't, it's kind of tough to get plants to get up through the stone. Well, like Kevin mentioned, Mason, you're, you're the expert, so I, I absolutely defer to you in this regard. So if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> Any other comments from commissioners? Someone, we still have, don't have a motion on the table. Um, uh, how about uh, just to clarify, I'll, I'll chair motion to uh, uh, approve the amendment. And if I can get a second to that, then we can have any final discussion before we vote yes or no. Is I'll there second. a second? I'll Ten second. Seconds. Okay. So um, We have a motion and now we have an opportunity to have any final discussion before voting. Uh, and there is a settlement agreement that goes along with the order of conditions. Um, and if 
if it's acceptable to the commission, I can just work with the city solicitor to remove the specific references to the construction of the, the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, and, and, and Jason, to your point, I'm, I'm as a non-engineer, I'm assuming the rough equivalence of the prior stone block or concrete block uh, retaining uh, structure and the, the new uh, gentler, lower, more slope to retaining structure, among other things uh, in terms of uh, 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 transfer of, of uh, animal life across, it'll be somewhat easier, I would think, with a 30 degree slope on either side rather than the vertical of the stone block. So I, um, I, I'm feeling okay about this as a rough equivalent in terms of uh, erosion risk. That's a good point, thank you, I, I, I agree. Um, any further discussion? If not, uh, so the motion on the table is to grant the amendment. Uh, all in favor, Sarah? Jen? Yes. Jason? Yes. Mason? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, thank you all. Mm. Um, we now have a uh, uh, be Sarah, which order shall we do it? The discussion, since Bob's been patiently waiting all this time, probably take the dog discussion at conservation areas first. Uh, let's just really quickly continue this hearing until next time. Oh, we'll that's right. We have one more. Yeah. The uh, applicant has asked that the uh, construction of an accessory residential structure on North Farms Road be continued to the next meeting, the 28th of July. Someone okay. want to make a motion to continue to that time? What time, Sarah? Uh, 5.30. 5.30. That'll be the first step on the 28th. Uh, so moved. Then moves on a second. I'll second it. Paul? All in favor, Sarah? Jen? Yes. Jason? Yes. Mason? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, now, uh, dog discussion. Bob Zimmerman is here. Um, I don't know if any of the other um, people on the call are uh, here for this particular discussion, uh, but the uh, uh, Bob had sent us all, uh, it was sent to me and I forwarded it, um, a document and um, Two documents, actually, both his his letter um, addressing the issue and the um, pamphlet that is now distributed with dog licenses. Um, Bob, want to start the discussion? Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Oh, um, I'm Bob Zimmerman. I'm president of Broadway Coalition, which manages the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area for the city, and I'm joined by Brad Tim, who is on the BBC board and uh, a wildlife biologist, and by Heidi Stevens, who is vice president of the Leeds Civic Association, since we have many um, problems and views uh, in common with the Leeds group. We've had what we call the dog problem for a considerable period of time. It goes back many years, and it consists of two items, really. The most important of these is unleashed dogs in conservation areas. And I'm going to speak mainly to Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, but uh, much of what I say applies to other conservation areas as well. Many people run their dogs unleashed in Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. This has numerous unfortunate implications. One is disturbance of wildlife because dogs don't stick to the paths. They roam into the surrounding areas. They disturb nesting birds and uh, any other wildlife that may be nearby. And they also, on numerous occasions, have attacked people be, uh, who are walking their dogs on leash, have attacked either their dogs or, in a few cases, the people walking those dogs. 
And I included a few examples of the emails that we receive having to do with uh, situations in which people have been uh, accosted essentially by dogs during their own presumably peaceful walks in the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, just to illustrate the kinds of incidents that occur. And what evidence do we have for unleashed dogs? We did a survey at the beginning of May where we uh, had uh, one board member or another from BBC uh, stand on Boggy Meadow Road at the eastern, main eastern entrance to the conservation area, counting the number of people with leash dogs and unleashed dogs. So we actually have a statistics about the size of the problem. It turns out that 63% of the people came with dogs that were unleashed. Almost two thirds of the visitors with dogs were running them unleashed. The second part of the problem is uh, significant, but somewhat less, and that is the deposition of dog waste along the trails and in the woods. And once again, unleashed dogs have the ability to go and poop off in the, the wilderness in the wild areas, which has some effect on wildlife and um, also along the trails, which is very unsightly. The, um, there are health implications of the deposition of dog waste, which isn't picked up, but I'll talk about the pickup of dog waste a little bit later. We have tried, the, and when I say we, I mean Broadway Coalition, um, have tried to mitigate the dog, pro, uh, dog problem in various different ways. We have had a brochure prepared, which is mailed out together with dog license renewals by the city clerk, uh, <clears throat> reaching something like 2,000 people uh, a year, and we've been doing that for two years, which explains why unleashed dogs are a problem in conservation areas. We have uh, spent approximately $800 a year producing the brochure, and uh, it's available also at the two main entrances to the conservation area on North Orange Road and uh, what we call the Moose Lodge, the end of Cook Avenue. We've also installed signs <clears throat> at numerous places throughout the conservation area, warning people or telling people uh, to please leash their dogs and pick up dog waste. And um, uh, that seems to have had some effect because we also offer um, waste bags for uh, dog waste free, absolutely free at uh, the major entrances to the conservation area. And we started doing this a number of years ago. And what we found was little bags of dog poop along the trails. People would pick up their waste, but they wouldn't carry it out. So last fall, we installed waste cans uh, once again, at the two main entrances to Fitzgerald Lake, uh, adjacent to where the, the bags for dog poop were available. And we found that they're used um, quite consistently. I'm not sure that everybody uses them, but I see much less dog waste left along the trails, either outside a bag or inside a bag. That, uh, those, Trash cans are emptied weekly by pedal people, and the total cost for the year is uh, slightly more than $1,300. So we're spending over $2,000 in two efforts to get people to uh, obey the city ordinances. And uh, in addition to that, uh, numerous articles have been written both in the BBC newsletter and the Leeds Civic Association newsletter and by Kevin in the Gazette recently about the requirement of uh, leashing dogs in conservation areas and why that's important. Now, the problem is that uh, there is absolutely no enforcement of those regulations. The city ordinance, there are two city ordinances that apply in this case, 
One has to do with unleashed dogs in public areas, including conservation areas, carries a $50 fine. Another for leaving dog waste, which is, uh, carries a $20 fine. To my knowledge, I have never heard of those regulations being enforced. And I've been associated with Broadway Coalition for over 20 years. There is a, an animal control officer in the city, at least one. Uh, it's a new person who I haven't met. Her name is Dawn Ubelacher. She works for the police department and not for anything, any entity, any uh, city department that has to do with the maintenance of the conservation areas. And that is a real problem because she works for the police department and not for us. And she apparently has no responsibility for ever visiting, patrolling the conservation areas or ticketing people uh, who uh, do not follow the rules. There are <clears throat> towns in Massachusetts that I'm aware of where the animal control officer does not work under the police department, but um, in Falmouth, for instance, on the Cape, the animal control officer works for the uh, Department of Marine and um, Environmental Affairs. So there are models of towns in Massachusetts where the animal control officer who has responsibilities for the conservation areas uh, works under an entity that was specifically responsible for those areas. Now, we believe at Broadway Coalition anyway, that we've done about all that we can in terms of informing people about the necessity or the desirability of keeping their dogs leashed and cleaned up in the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. There's very little more that we can do. We have no enforcement uh, capacity whatsoever. And we propose uh, that the Conservation Commission help us out in this area by advocating for two things. The first is an environmental or conservation officer who would be responsible for uh, patrolling conservation areas throughout the city, would be empowered to give out fines and tickets for people uh, who are ignoring the rules that the city has set itself. So I wanna re re reiterate at this point that I think it's absolutely out of line that the city has ordinances about dog leashing and dog waste pickup, which are not enforced and to my knowledge, never have been enforced. The second area in which we would appreciate the advocacy of the Conservation Commission is in the area of a dog park. Right now, all of the conservation areas in Northampton are being used as dog parks, essentially, without any regulation. There was an effort to establish a, a private dog park on Glendale Road, which, as far as I know, has really, um, uh, is really a dead letter right now. I don't think anything's happening there. I think at one time in the city, I, I know the mayor was, <laughs> Mayor Narkowitz was very hopeful that that was uh, going to open and take off some of the pressure on conservation areas. That's not happened and uh, I seriously doubt at this point that it will happen. So this would take quite a bit of pressure off the conservation areas and would provide a place where people could go under uh, a given set of conditions, a given set of rules and regulations and enjoy uh, a park-like setting with some supervision. Now, I know that the Conservation Commission does not have the kind of funds to either support the hiring of a conservation officer or to establish a dog park. So that's why I'm asking you to uh, serve as our advocates in these areas. And I'd like to call your attention once again to the fact that the Conservation Commission owns the conservation areas in Northampton. That is, you all own almost 25% of the surface area of Northampton. 
And that carries responsibility for the maintenance of those areas as well. Whether there, where money can be found, I would uh, not even presume to propose a, a solution in that area, but I can see that it would be possible for several city departments to work together on this. The uh, sustainability and planning, uh, planning and sustainability is obviously one, uh, parks and recreation is another, possibly even the, uh, the new department of um, community care. Uh, so there's some uh, possibility, I think, that various departments could work together on both hiring a conservation officer and eventually establishing a dog park. And I just note in passing that you may think that this is going to be very expensive and that there's no money available for things like this. I'd like to point out that when the dog pound was proposed for the parking lot at the Moose Lodge at the end of uh, Cook Avenue, the proposal was to spend $800,000 to build this kennel, which would, according to the people in the know, would uh, accommodate maybe two or three dogs a night in the course of the year. So there's clearly, I don't know where that $800,000 was coming from, but there's clearly money circulating within the city that's available for uh, new ventures, such as a conservation officer and a dog park. And a conservation officer, I've looked at the salaries of conservation officers in other towns. It averages about $60,000 for a full-time employee, which is a heck of a lot less than 800,000. 800,000 would fund that as a person of that sort for uh, 15 years. So I would like to uh, uh, invite my colleagues, Brad and Heidi, to make any comments they would like to make at this point, and then hopefully uh, hear your response to the requests that we're making tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Sure, Brad, Heidi. Sure, I can go quickly here. Uh, I don't want to eat up too much time, but I'm going to speak. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Brad Tim. I'm a board member of BBC, have been for about four years now. Uh, master's in wildlife er, and PhD in wildlife conservation from UMass. Um, and yeah, uh, I've observed the off leash dog problem firsthand over and over again. And um, it really is pretty striking and concerning. Um, you know, there's, there are loads of scientific studies out there on the effects of <clears throat> unleashed dogs on native wildlife communities and species. So I'll just, I, I'm not gonna go into incredible detail here, but I'll just give you kind of the highlights or lowlights of, of kind of what they've found. You know, first and foremost, direct mortality. Um, anything from birds, reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, um, you name it, you know, dogs go after it. We've all seen it with dogs chasing squirrels. It's just a fight or flight response. You know, they see something running, they go after it. Um, there's been a number of studies that have shown that um, it actually reduces the amount of habitat because wildlife move away from the trails when they're constantly impacted um, by dogs running off into the woods after them. So it actually acts to reduce the amount of habitat that these conservation areas are providing for our native wildlife species. Um, it increases stress hormones, uh, stress relief release across all taxa of wildlife. Number of, of effects of that makes them more prone to disease, uh, thus impacting their survival. Um, reduces reproductive output because of that stress. So they're not reproducing as much. They have smaller clutch sizes uh, like birds. You know, often will have a less number of um, eggs per nesting event. Reduce longevity. I mean, the, the amount of stress that you, you release just inherently reduces longevity of animals. Um, and actually found that it, it indirectly, indirectly impacts their response to humans. So they actually have a greater fright, flight response to humans. Um, you know, so if it's an area that dogs weren't off leash, things like deer and other, other mammals may not be as likely to flee when they see the you know, the humans, but when dogs are an issue, 
they're more likely to flee. Changes behavioral patterns. Uh, a lot of species become less active during the daytime when dogs are a potential threat to them. So they may shift their activity to nighttime, which has a number of impacts, one of which is more predators may be active at night. So they're exposing themselves to predation. Um, reduced time feeding young uh, birds. This has been documented a number of times. Um, birds will abandon, female birds will abandon their nests, more so in areas that have dog off leash uh, than, than don't have dogs off leash. Um, as, dog, as, as Bob spoke to, um, then we also have the issue with actually directly spreading disease through their fecal material um, or direct interaction with wildlife. So things like rabies, giardia, canine distemper, a whole host. And then water quality impacts, you know, all kinds of viruses, E. coli, hookworms, roundworms, salmonella, um, and the list goes on and on. So, so again, that's, that's just kind of a, a laundry list. And, and there's a whole host of primary literature out there that has specifically researched this and found these impacts. So, so from a wildlife perspective, it's, it's incredibly concerning. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Heidi. Thank you. Um, my name's Heidi Stevens. I just have to make a quick correction for Bob. I'm no longer um, the vice president of Lead Civic Association. I was for seven years, but now I'm a board member. Um, first of all, I would like to just applaud all of the efforts that um, Broadbrook Coalition and that group has done to protect Fitzgerald Lake. Yeah, I think it's one of the crown jewels of our conservation areas in Northampton and people travel to Northampton to go to that area. Um, as far as Leeds Civic uh, or Leeds conservation areas, we have Roberts Hill, we have um, conservation Beaver Brook um, uh, and this new conservation area along the river. Uh, we have the same problems with off dog, uh, off leash dogs. Um, uh, ki uh, several kits of fox were killed recently um, mm. just down the road from me um, by off-leash dogs. Um, they scare people. Um, I sent a letter in. I don't know if you got that, Kevin Lake, um, and the commission about what Lead Civic has been trying to do. We published a letter in, in our monthly newsletter. Um, explaining the ordinances that the city have, the rules and the regulations to try to remind people um, of the rules and encourage them to abide by them. We've had um, uh, dog socials on the public green, on the main, on, uh, the main street green, just to uh, bring people together to help people understand what they can do, share ideas. We had um, our old city councilor, Elisa Klein, helped us uh, get signage up stating the ordinances along the Main Street Green. That's not a conservation area, but we we're really successful there because it's a public place. It's very visible. And so people are way more aware. They're, um, pay they know they're, they're being observed, so they're going to abide by the rules. In conservation areas, no one's watching them. And they know no one's watching them. They know that no one's going to do anything. I have had instances myself where I have had to stand for five minutes begging someone to please put their dog on a leash before they bother to do it. So they know no one's around. No one's going to going to stop them. So, uh, and of course the dog bag. So to make a long story short. Um, Yes, Northampton has a lot of conservation acreage that is a public uh, playground for people to do what they want and um, break rules. Um, I was curious like what other towns conservation um, commissions do. And so this morning I just did a quick Google search and just looked up you know, conservation areas and enforcement or, or dogs. And I came across, um, the first one I saw was Wayland Mass. And um, they have 1,200 acres. So um, 
their Conservation Commission's website land and trails page caught my eye because in big, bold, red letters, um, they had a warning to dog owners. And it read, please note, there have been numerous reports of dog waste not being removed from the conservation area. If this continues, dogs may not be allowed to use the areas. So they're putting out a warning, a public warning to help educate people. Um, that, um, the woman that I spoke with there, Monica, she directed me to the Town of Lincoln's Conservation Commission because they have the same problem with off-leash dogs and dog waste. And they have um, 2,000 uh, acres of conservation land, lots of trails. And what they're doing is they have an ad to hire a conservation, what do they call it? Um, a conservation land steward slash ranger. And the job responsibilities that are listed in the posting are patrol conservation lands, user outreach, provide education, help supervise seasonal volunteers. And that position um, full time is like $50,000. Um, the thing that, that the user outreach Signage can't do it alone. I'm a graphic designer. I make a lot of like signs and, and brochures and communicate graphically. But um, people read signs that goes out of their mind if they want to do what they want to do. So this human outreach, having a, a person with the agency to um, either educate or um, direct people in the uh, uh, right way to be, you know, just advise them, put your dog on a leash, there's a fine if you don't, um, will help to change behavior. Um, it has to be a human human contact. I really believe that. So a conservation ranger, I think is um, a very important uh, uh, position for Northampton to get behind and I and one other quick, very quick aside to prove my point. Um, as you all know, we do have a, a big issue along the river in Leeds, and I'm only spending a very tiny moment on this to, to um, buffer my point. Um, a few weekends, myself, our group, Leeds Civic Volunteers, and um, Friends of Northampton Trails were trying a new tactic with the groups that go down there, and we're talking to them. We're giving them garbage bags. We're shoulder to shoulder with them, looking out at the beautiful place, explaining why it's really important to take your trash away. Here, would you like some bags? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. I'd say that um, maybe 50% of the bags that we use make it out. And, and we do, there is a lot of garbage that is left there and a lot that is taken out. But to me, that just proved that, that this, we need a ranger. We need someone speaking to the other individuals, um, the users. So um, I would just uh, hope that the city can find money to um, hire a conservation ranger. And I just wanna also point out that in 2020, there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of public meetings. There was a lot of discourse in the newspaper and back and forth about the problems in Leeds conservation areas and along the river. And one thing that the public was behind, it sounded as if the um, Office of Planning and Sustainability was behind, that the mayor was behind, that Leeds Civic was behind, was hiring a conservation ranger to do reach out education to help change people's behavior. I'm convinced that signage won't do it. Yeah. All right, that's that's my bit. <laughs> Thank <clears throat> you. Yeah, my big idea was to have a bright orange insert when you hand out the licenses for dogs, playing the two different ordinances. But apparently that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and I think as we've noticed and as we just heard, um, people read it and it goes right out of their minds yeah. as soon as they're out of sight of anybody who might 
hassle them about it. And even when they do hassle, as uh, Bob's letter indicates, um, they treat the person who's pointing out the Tim. law as if they're the problem. What do you mean telling me what to do with my dog? Um, the one thing that I will say, I have just a couple of hours ago this afternoon, I had sent uh, Chief Jody Casper an email and got a re saying, hey, is there any way we could get even an hour a month, some way of getting an animal control officer to uh, walk the trails in conservation areas, specifically at Fitzgerald Lake, um, just so we can then honestly put up a sign saying, these trails are regularly patrolled um, by the city's animal control officer and fines will be given. Uh, for breaking the rules about uh, leashes and feces. Um, and she, I got a reply that you know she was on vacation, so I wasn't expecting her to get back to me, but a couple of hours ago I did. And um, she, her email I will read, it says, good afternoon, Kevin. Thank you for reaching out with your concern regarding unleashed dogs in Northampton and specifically in the Fitzgerald Lake area. I completely understand your concerns and agree that a culture has developed where dog owners believe this is acceptable behavior. This has been something that we have wanted to target for a while, but turnover in the part-time and full-time animal control officer positions has reduced our staffing and we have had to prioritize other matters. That being said, we have a new ACO who has hit the ground running and we are in the midst of filling the part-time ACO position. We are conducting interviews for that later this month. Once both positions are filled, we will be able to allocate some resources to education regarding unleashed dogs. Fitzgerald Lake and Smith Farm Fields are two areas that we will prioritize. Um, have a good evening, Chief Casper. Um, so I would wanna uh, suggest that uh, we, the Conservation Commission, uh, and Broadbrook and Lead Civic, uh, whenever Chief uh, Casper gets back to me that says, yes, we have hired now the part-timer to go with the full-timer, um, that we uh, schedule a meeting and have a discussion and cover much the same material um, that we've just covered here tonight and make it clear that well, it's got to be a little more than just education. Yes, we appreciate having you know something rather than nothing, uh, but uh, it, people have to know that there's some teeth behind this and that then we might be able to modify um, their behavior. So I, I take that as a first little bit of positive news because in the past we haven't been able to get any of the um, ACO's time. But I'm also intrigued by the idea uh, of a, 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 a ranger or a, a steward of some kind. Yes. Um, I know that the Amherst, for instance, in their paid staff from the city, they have 2.75 FTEs. Uh, we have half of Sarah. Um, so, you know, other towns do allocate more resources to take care of their conservation lands. So um, this is not, and I, I understand Sarah, we also have some interns sometimes and some part-timers elsewhere in the department. And we, we do have uh, half of Tom's time as well, yeah. which, which is great, but it was, you know, that was a long, battle to even Take get to even someone get to be able to do that. And the city is anticipating budget shortfalls in the upcoming years. Yep, no, understood. Um, but the fact that this, we, you know, we have a mandate, my the way I'm approaching this and the way I wrote to Chief Casper is part of my job on the Conservation Commission is to uh, uh, take seriously our requirements to protect the eight interests defined in the Wildlife Protection Act. Um, that includes wildlife and wildlife habit and habitat and water quality and uh, um, open space protection of various kinds. And so I, 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 my own feeling is that just saying, well, I guess there isn't enough money, we, there's not much we can do about it, fails to fulfill our mandate. Um, fails to fulfill our responsibility. If we make a lot of noise and we still come up empty and all we've got is part of uh, a part-time animal control officer, okay, well, maybe we try it again next year. But that this is uh, um, something that has been problematic. And I have, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here in Vermont right now. And we let our dog out the door because we're on a dirt road and, and it's, uh, but you know, she goes out and barks at night, and um, she is 
you know, we've had bears come and rustle through the, the compost and so forth. And I know that when we're here, her out there barking means the bears aren't coming anywhere near. Um, and that's okay, but once we're gone, they come back um, and we're only here part time. So I recognize the impact that dogs have. And I have had that same dog attacked by other dogs when I'm walking around a leash down along the Newark River. Um, so it is, I understand completely and have personal experience with, yep, I love dogs, great to have dogs. And they are apex predators um, that we are introducing into habitat that um, has an, a reaction to the presence of apex predators. And you never get that many apex predators in a given acreage um, in any other place if they weren't being introduced by humans. Um, so we have a responsibility both ethically um, and we have a mandate um, by our, our charter as an, um, a conservation commission. So I'm, I'm happy to figure out ways that we can advocate it would be great if there were a position that was part of, I imagine, a, a colleague to Sarah within planning and sustainability that supported, um, as a ranger or steward, or supported uh, conservation areas that full time. That would be a wonderful thing. I haven't imagined it to be possible, but when you point out that, well, hey, Lincoln, the, well, Lincoln's a very rich community, but sure, there are other models that maybe we can try to push. If we don't plant the seed now, it isn't going to be any different five years from now. So those are my thoughts. Yeah. I do like the suggestion in one of the letters that large, large uh, signs at the entrance, two entrances show like with explaining the two ordinances, bright colors. Um, I know signs don't work according to uh, Heidi, but Maybe if in the right place, you know, people start off with the walk, they'll see that. We, we did have some Mason and one of them actually just got stolen. <laughs> but it, it clearly spelled out the city ordinance requirements and, and the penalties for that. Um, yeah, the signs were pretty if, big. If people want to let their dogs off leashes. Just they weren't brightly colored, but they were pretty big they want to. Yeah. But they, I think if we have the signs and um, word gets around that there's been some tickets handed out. I think that will, people will take more seriously. Yeah. And it, it is yeah. a general city ordinance. So under the current structure, uh, conservation staff can't issue any tickets for that. Only the uh, police department is able to do that. I do think the fines are far too low. And I think it would be much more effective to try to lobby for an amendment to those regulations so that uh, I mean, if I saw a sign that said $50 fine um, or a $20 fine for not picking up waste, uh, I, you know, I would take that seriously. But if I was uh, callous and careless and I saw a sign that said $250 fine for an unleashed dog, I think I would think twice about uh, not um, putting my dog on a leash. I tend to agree that without any sort of um, enforcement, you know, it's meaningless. It is you know, what we're what we're talking about, and I also agree that exploring having a staff member in the city enforce the ordinance is huge. Now, because I, I feel like this is being raised to an issue that we need to seriously put our heads around. I mean, do we have access to funds, to, for example, hire a police detail one day a month, for example, to go out with Tom and walk conservation land and call out people? for violating the ordinance and enough mm. fines. I mean, do we have access to that kind of funds? Ah, so it'd be equivalent to, um, you know, you're having utility work done and you get a red -a cop to be um, yes. uh, directing traffic or whatever. I, yes. I, you know, I work at an engineering firm. We hire police details for all sorts of purposes, not just traffic. Maybe it's keeping people away from a work area, whether on public or private property, all sorts of things. Um, but this is certainly within the wheelhouse of something a detail might do. Um, I, I recognize it's probably something they've never done before, um, but I think it's 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 legitimate and justifiable. Hmm. I think uh, one aspect of it is that it's very important that people, the public in general, through the Gazette or whatever <clears throat> means of communication, actually see that some people are being ticketed and fined 
yes. for unleash dogs and failure to pick up poop. Because I think that's that's what's going to make an impression on people. I don't think, uh, you know, it's nice to have the signs and so forth, but uh, I don't think people look at them an awful lot. I think people were affected by the fact that we put waste cans at the entrances to put their dog poop into the into the cans. But as far as leashing goes, I think it really somebody has to be, or maybe several people have to be apprehended and actually mm -hmm. find, and there has to be citywide publicity about yes. that happening. Yep, blogged in the town yeah. square. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, BBC has done an amazing job here to educate and to try to regulate this a bit, but uh, you have done all you can and you need uh, reinforcements and enforcement at this point. And I, I wonder what the next step would be for us. Um, do we advocate um, in some concerted voice with the city councilors and the mayor? Um, what's, what's the process looking like? Well, that's a good question. I think certainly, uh, once Chief Casper gets back and says, okay, we now are fully staffed with ACOs, one and a half, mm -hmm. one, one plus a part-time, yeah. um, that we should meet with her, not just I meet with her, but something like this gathering, meet with yeah. her and explain what the issue is uh, in more uh, compelling detail. Um, but I'm also interested in uh, Jason's idea about, so how much does it cost to rent a cop for a couple of hours? Um, and how might that person go along with members of the Conservation Commission or members of uh, Lead Civic or BBC um, uh, uh, once or twice a month so that we then can say, ah, um, you know, regularly patrolled by Northampton Police. Heidi, what were you gonna say? I can tell you what they cost because we've, um, Lead Civic Association, private um, uh, residents, chart pack, we've hired, police details for chart pack dam for several years, except for the past couple. Um, they go in four hour increments. You have to hire them for four hours. You have to schedule them. Usually you, you put in a request three days prior to when you need them. Mm -hmm. um, it, when we hired them, it was 50 bucks an hour. So it was about 200. It, I know that the price has gone up though. Mm -hmm. So you probably, talking maybe 250, 260 for a four hour period. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do they have their full legal enforcement ability in that utility when they're- They do. They can write tickets and do all that? Okay. Yes, and they have done, they've cited people at the dam in 2017. Right. No different than enforcing the speed limit. Right. I mean, I think the bonus in this scenario is, is we're not having an officer come and do something that's extracurricular to their routine, you know, mm -hmm. on a shift where we're, we're saying, this is your job today. This is what we'd <laughs> like you to do yeah. to call out the people with dogs. That's your focus. Mm -hmm. Warn them to wear hiking shoes though. <laughs> we, we had some police officers, whenever did survey work, you had to have police officers, either town or state. And uh, in the middle of winter, if you have a police sergeant standing there stuffing newspapers into his shoes because <laughs> of <the> winter time, <laughs> they got to dress appropriately. I, I have a little bit of hesitation going the strict police officer route that I just want to name in that I understand the problem and I understand what everyone is saying about face-to-face -face relationship building and enforcement is the most effective solution. But one of the goals of conservation land is for people's enjoyment. And I, different communities have different relationships with policing and I would, in an ideal world, have that person be both an outreach, like holding both outreach and welcoming people to use spaces in appropriate ways, and also enforcing the rules that exist. Um, I guess just a punitive approach 
Like I understand the efficacy of it, but it makes me a little uncomfortable for that reason. Um, I don't know that I would stand in the way of the entire commission, but I just wanted to name that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I've been, as the commissioners know, I, I've been willing to say, hey, um, we can uh, prohibit dogs at all um, and from a given, given our mandate to protect environment. If people aren't willing to have their dogs on a leash on a reliable basis, so we can say that allowing dogs off leash is inconsistent with our mandate. And so we could prohibit them altogether. But uh, I, I think as, as Jen points out, no, the, these are public lands and a number of people who are members of the public um, have dogs and if they can be well controlled, that's not inconsistent with our mandate. So it's a, how do we find ways to um, fulfill our, 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 our charter, but also uh, allow the citizenry to feel good about uh, going there. And I understand that uh, there are populations, I think in Northampton, um, most police interactions that I see uh, are much more progressive than I've seen in other communities. Um, but the, it is still the case that different people, um, not all people are uh, old white guys like me. And um, so we'll have a different sense of what uh, having a cop come towards you is going to imply. Um, and but there's I think just a really very, like, it's also an economic issue of like a $50 ticket is going to have different economic impact on different people. Same with a $250 ticket. Um, Heidi, you, you had brought up the example of one community that, that had a, a pretty threatening posting about dogs not being able to be allowed in the future if problems continued. And that, that would actually be pretty easy to enforce if that's something that the commission were supportive of. Um, you know, we could easily have Tom go out and just say, no, you have a dog. No, no, you have a dog. You can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that would, it couldn't just be an idle threat. It would be, need to be something the commission was willing to put forward. And that might also have the unintended consequence of really oh, yeah. turning, turn, <laughs> turning people off to future open spaces and right. uh, additional requests. And, and also the, the policing, um, although I, I absolutely empathize and, and understand the uh, the problems with dogs, you know, I've, I've had issues running in the past where I've tripped over dogs and, and hurt myself. And, you know, I'm, I'm a small person, big dogs are a little, a little scary to me and I understand the wildlife impacts, but we also want to um, increase equity and accessibility to conservation areas. And if, if people know that there's a, a police officer walking around, they might not be willing to uh, go out and recreate the way that they want to. I, so just some, just a few things to think about. Um, I agree too. I, I can't really envision um, a uniformed officer walking around Fitzgerald Lake. Um, I don't know if they're allowed to wear plain, plain clothes or not, and maybe just a badge without all their other heavy duty gear that's so intimidating. Right. Right. Um, that's, why, that's why a conservation ranger makes sense because mm -hmm. they're they're yep. dressed in plain clothes, but they would have the authority to um, cite someone. And before they ever cite someone, they would advise them first, yep. you know, put your dog on a leash. You have to have it on a leash in this area. And um, I'm sure that if they, the person saw the badge on the plaid shirt and, you know, the person showed, the ranger showed their credential, that that dog walker is going to put the dog on the leash and that dog walker is going to tell their friends that wow i ran into a ranger at on um, in fitzgerald lake and i got a warning you know yeah I, I i think that's a very very important part that both you heidi and, and jen have made that um a, a cop sort of just doesn't do it and i'd, I'd really hate to threaten people with closing conservation areas for one i think it would be physically impossible but the second point is that um, for people who obey the rules, walking in the conservation areas has been a tremendous advantage, particularly during COVID. And I've watched, I live on North Farms Road and I watched when the COVID restrictions came in in uh, 2020, that there were cars parked on, at the Fisher Lake entrance all up and down the road. I counted 40 cars one time. So it was an immense benefit to people in general. 
And a lot of those people don't have dogs. They're just walking. They, they, mm -hmm. they may be attacked by dogs, but um, they're just there to walk. And uh, a lot of dog walkers among them. But uh, it's a, it was a tremendous relief valve. And I think we ought to be encouraging people to walk in the conservation areas, but um, to walk with their dogs leashed and uh, be aware of, uh, of their surroundings. So, I would so how about if, if I propose, because I promised my wife I would be done by 7.30 um, <laughs> so we can have dinner. Um, yeah. How about if I propose that uh, I will alert this gathering uh, when I hear from Chief Casper so that we can schedule a meeting with her so that the animal control officer's time can be used in a way we agree is optimal um, for this purpose. And um, uh, I will... Uh, give both give thought and solicit ideas from you about um, how might we present to uh, city council um, a case for, uh, even if it's not gonna fit in the existing current year's budget uh, uh, for a ranger, uh, for a steward, um, and how that was is consistent with our charter as a conservation commission and uh, is something that other communities in the Commonwealth have been able to pull off. And we start there um, and put on hold for the moment um, um, other, other avenues, uh, whether increasing fines or having uniform uh, police at conservation areas. Um, uh, but then we just start with those two things. So let's plant the seed about the whole idea of a, uh, a staffer for conservation areas. Um, and um, uh, then thinking about how to optimize whatever number of hours Chief Casper can give us of the uh, animal control officer staff. Yes. I think that's excellent. I think that's an excellent way to get started on this, Kevin. Both of the things you mentioned, I think are important ways to go. I agree. Yeah, this is great. That's great next steps. All right. Great. Good. Well, thank you all. This has been a rich and uh, useful uh, discussion and has added to uh, the Overton window of my imagining about what might be possible here. So, um, yeah, I was thinking game cameras, you know, and tracking the people down and sending the fines. But um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to get to that point yet. No, right. they don't have license numbers. <laughs> Balance state. Uh. Okay. Any last thoughts? If not, I'll uh, uh, I'll send a note to everybody when we have a, uh, a time back from the uh, chief uh, to schedule that, and I'll I'll try brainstorming with Sarah about how we might put a few paragraphs together, and I'm happy to make a presentation during public comment period to a city council meeting about. Uh, okay. We're wrestling with these kinds of issues in our conservation areas, and uh, we're looking to them at some point to help us with the resources necessary to do what they have asked us to do, what they and the Commonwealth have asked yeah. conservation commissions and conservation areas to do. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thanks well, very much. For listening. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Oh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> well moved. I was so just gonna end a minute. second. But so we're gonna to... discuss Pomeroy Meadow Plumpton or other acquisition. Oh uh we don't so Mason, I sent out my presentation that I gave the other night just as a, a fun FYI because I'm excited oh. about the project. Yeah, that's um, not, but, but we not can not talk an about item on the agenda, a, just just meeting, background. Definitely. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks everybody. We don't we won't Thank call you, the roll call for the motion to adjourn.